In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for the beautiful weather, and thank you once again for the beautiful opportunity to spend time together in your word. Open our hearts and minds this evening to show us where to turn when life puts us on a difficult path, and also show us that sometimes following you can put us on a difficult path, and what to do when that happens. We ask you to guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, these are kind of two really neat sections of Psalm 119. So the first one, we're going to look at 97 through 104 uh, tonight. So Psalm 119, 97 to 104. This section is about what to do when we're tempted to take a bad path, an evil path, the wrong path, whatever we want to call it. And then the very next section, kind of like a bookend, verses 105 to 112 are going to show us, okay, when following Christ, when we're on a godly path, what do you do when that path turns out to be a little on the dark and dangerous side? So kind of two similar situations uh, kind of put put into a position by opposite means. Uh, So we'll see where, uh, where it takes us tonight. So I'll go ahead and read again from Robert Alter's translation, and then we'll uh, compare notes on what we've got. So, Psalm 119, starting in verse 97. 97? 97. How I loved your teaching, all day long it was my theme. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is mine forever. I have understood more than all my teachers, for your precepts became my theme. I gained insight more than the elders, for your decrees I kept. From all evil paths I held back my feet, so that I might observe your word. From your laws I did not swerve, for you yourself instructed me. How sweet to my palate your utterance, more than honey to my mouth. From your decrees I gained insight, Therefore, I hated all paths of lies. A lamp to my feet is your word and a light to my path. I swore and I will fulfill it to observe your just laws. I have been sorely afflicted. O Lord, give me life as befits your word. Accept my mouth's free offerings, Lord, and teach me your laws. My life is at risk at all times, yet your teaching I do not forget. The wicked set a trap for me, yet from your decrees I did not stray. I inherit your precepts forever, for they are my heart's joy. I inclined my heart to do your statutes forever without fail. Those are two pretty good sections. Uh, Anybody have anything in the translation they are reading that is different or interesting or an interesting turn of phrase as opposed to Dr. Alter's version. Who is Dr. Alter? Robert Alter is a, a, a Jewish scholar. He's a secular Jew, not a, not a religiously practicing Jew. And he is a uh, ancient Hebrew scholar. And he is, his life's work has been translating the Jewish scriptures into English. And he just finished it, oh, maybe last summer, I think it was. Uh, and then he also has written a classic a work called uh, The Art of Biblical Poetry, which talks about, obviously, the Psalms and the other uh, poetry portions of Scripture. And they also wrote another little book that's a classic. It's called The Art of uh, Biblical Translation. Mm -hmm. Uh, So again, because he's treating Scripture like a work of, of fine literature, because he's not a practicing religious Jew, so first off, we're not going to see Christ in his translation. That light is not going to come to the surface, being one Jewish and being two secular. But he, he really gets into what the, what the Hebrew says, what it would have said to the person back then. Uh, so you get kind of the imagery. It's more poetic. It's more flowery. Uh, sometimes it's just flat out different than some of our English translations. And I enjoy reading it because of that freshness it brings to it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a better translation or uh, for any reason. It's just it gives you a different set of eyes and ears on the text uh, as opposed to, you know, reading sometimes the ESV like we use in church. 
it's it's a good literal very literal translation but because of that literalness sometimes it just falls flat when you're trying to read it out loud uh, especially on sunday morning it just the next word you think should be is not what the next word is um, it can be a little dry and a little flat um, but so it's just a different take on things uh, and that's why, why i enjoy reading them but uh, again it's no substitute for reading you know any of our other English translations. Not that the translator should be bringing his own stuff to the table, but translation inherently does. The translator is inherently going to bring bias. Uh, that's no different in any translation that we read. Uh, but when it's unusual, when you have a guy that just does it by himself, uh, that makes it unique because he has total control over it for better or for worse. Uh, for example, I'll talk about Luther's translation of the New Testament. It's fantastic. Uh, even before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, even before the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were discovered, all these manuscripts that we have now, which led to like the new King James, because there's some stuff in the King James that's not quite right in light of what was discovered. But Luther's translation here 500 years later, it holds up to all that new evidence. So I always say, you know, it wasn't Luther wasn't divinely inspired to do his translation, but... God had a special place in his heart for that first uh, German translation of the New Testament. Again, one guy did it himself. Now, uh, opposite story out of Lutheran history would be Dr. William F. Beck. Uh, the only reason I know who he is is because I got his translation uh, kind of hot off the press when I was baptized at age six. My pastor gave it to me. And it was great because for a child reading it, it's like, oh, well, this is easy to understand because in school it was King James, which is ah, when you're young, right? Even now. Uh, but again, one guy who didn't do his homework. So Synod never adopted his translation because his Hebrew was terrible. And he uh, just went, oh, okay, this is what this commentator said this means. And that guy was wrong. So it was just, yeah, this is just a, not good. His New Testament was okay. They actually approved it, but the language didn't hold up. He was trying to write it in the language of the everyday American in the mid seventies. And it sounds like it not, there's no slang or anything like that. You just read it and go, wow, this sounds dated. You know, the King James sounds classic. The Beck Bible sounds dated. Like, well, what is this? Uh, so it just didn't, do well. It didn't hold up. And that's why nobody knows what is that translation because you've never heard of it because it didn't catch on. It wasn't good. And again, that's the result of one guy doing the translation alone. So there's good and bad things for that uh, with all translations. Uh, so we try to add this turning into a little discourse on Bible translations, but you know, most of the, the pastors coming out of seminaries today in conservative uh, denominations like Lutherans are, uh, they're going to say, well, you got to be literal, literal, literal. We've got to be true to what the word actually said in the original languages, which is good. Yes, we want to do that, but it's not, it doesn't read like a story, which they were. These were stories read out loud to the people who couldn't read and you memorized them. And so it had to sound like a story somebody was saying. So the literal, literal, literal translation is fantastic, but it's a little dull to read sometimes. And sometimes it's just hard to read. Uh, and then you go the opposite way, you get the paraphrases. Uh, my mom loved the Living Bible, today's her birthday, so I remember that. Uh, so she loved the Living Bible. It was a paraphrased translation. It's really easy to read. Theologically, it's a little sketchy in places, but you know, it's easy to read. It gets people to read their Bible. And then today we have like uh, what, like the Good News translation or what's the other one? I think it's the Good News. This one's called The Message. Yeah, The Message. You know, The, the Message is a good one because it's really, it really, you, you kind of puts you in the story. You know, it's like a, it's just like if you were sitting around a campfire listening to a story, that's what that Bible sounds like. And again, theologically, it gets a little sketchy in places. So a paraphrase has its issues. A literal translation has its issues read a couple of them, you know, that's, there is no one size fits all when it comes to translations. We all have our, our favorites. You know, there's those people are going to say, well, you know, if the King James version was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. Like that's the only translation of the Bible that ever was correct. And it's good, but it's not perfect either. 
it's only going to be perfect if you read it in the original languages, which even guys that study it their whole lives don't necessarily know what everything says. There's, especially in Hebrew, there's things you'll get to, and they're just like, we don't know what this means. And every footnote in every Bible you read goes, we don't actually know what that means. Because it's just weird. So, so just be aware when, when you look at different translations of Bibles. So the great thing about like Bible Hub and the, those sites is you can put them right next to each other. You can put like six of them right next to each other if you want. And they're all going to be really, really close. And every now and then they go kind of oh, a little weird. Uh, but I think it's, it's a good thing. Uh, because each translator in each group, like the ESV and the big translations, those are huge committees that get together and decide, okay, what, what is this saying? We're all going to agree on the little variations that the Greek manuscripts have, and we're going to vote, and we're going to go, okay, this is the way it should be rendered in English. Boom. And that's probably great and very scholarly and very dry when you try to read it. It's just going to be hard to read. So just be aware, when you look at different kinds of translations, what school of thought it came from and what was the purpose of the translation you know is it is it for children to be able to read is it to be read aloud in public is it supposed to be uh, literal and true to the original languages at the at the sake of it being easy to read in english and then you figure everybody has to do that in every language that the word gets translated to and you're like wow that's pretty incredible uh, the amount of work that takes <laughs> And yet they still put out new translations. We have new, tr new versions in English all the time uh, because someone's going to try to do it better or a little different. And if the word reaches somebody through that translation, then great. Then they serve the purpose for which it was commissioned. Okay, so that's enough about translations. So verse 97. Verse 97. Yep. In the NAS, the one I have, um, New American Standard, it's got, um, I don't remember what you said uh, all day long, it was my theme. My theme. Yeah, what is it? No, no, but, but what was, the, instead of law, he said what? Oh, I loved your teaching, teaching all day long. That was it. Yep. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, the, the word that caught me was, in mine, it says my meditation. Okay. Which to me is like a, a um, you can have a theme in your life of how you uh, are conducting yourself, you know, a Christian theme or mm -hmm. a joyful theme or a righteous theme or, or, you know, something like that. But a meditation to me seems to be, this is, this is the essence of me when, when I'm quiet, this is what's happening with me. Mm -hmm. It's, it's this, this, the law of the Lord or the teachings of the Lord. That's what my mind is going to go to. True. That's, why meditation for me works better than his theme, but I don't know what anybody else has. <clears throat> I think that's interesting too. That's a good example of how even in English, certain words take on a certain connotation. Now, when I think of meditation, I think of like Eastern mm. religions, Eastern philosophy. So it's like if I'm meditating on something, I'm emptying my mind and I have this thing in my head and I just let that be what's going on upstairs to the exclusion of all else. Uh, or theme, you think of a theme song, right? Or a jingle. So if the law of the Lord is your jingle, the law of the Lord is that thing that just keeps going through. And I think Luther would kind of appreciate that because he always said you let it go through your head just over and over and over and over. You know, he said you will study the catechism being the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer your entire life. And he goes, even as an old man, you still haven't scratched the surface. You're like a child with it every day. So he would appreciate that, that kind of thinking about theme. Because, okay, you just let go of your head like a, like a school lesson over and over and over until you got it. Uh, yeah. But in the end, they all kind of corral to the same idea. It, it's, it's, that's what your focus was. But I, I like that. That's a good point. Okay, well, let's go. What do I have? Yeah, meditation is what uh, ESV has too. And I thought V is I meditate on it all day long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and see how that theme goes back to speaking of theme, goes all the way back to when we first started this psalm. We talked about it, Psalm 1. 
and about how, you know, oh Lord, I delight in your commandments. You know, that's on my mind all the time. That's what he was saying from the very first psalm. I think about it all day long. Right. That's very sincere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. All right, so we have our translations. We have our favorite translations. We have our different ways that first verse is rendered. And we just spent 20 minutes just talking about that. So how can we ever exhaust all the life-changing and glorious benefits that come to us from studying scripture? We're never going to. So, you know, we're, that's why we're spending weeks on the longest chapter of the Bible because Psalm 119 tries to wrap its mind around, the psalmist is trying to wrap his mind around God's law and how it affects every aspect of his life. And one thing that he constantly comes back to is about how scripture is sufficient for everything. You know, it's like, oh, well, what's your problem today? The Bible has something about that. It does. You know, we might not even want to admit it sometimes. And sometimes it just seems, oh, well, of course, the Bible has something to say about it. But how does that help me now? Okay, then you're missing the point. You know, just reading God's word doesn't make all the problems go away. But it does have, it does have answers. It tends to refocus you. So keeping in mind this is a song, he's singing about how every, every area of his life is sufficiently covered by Scripture. The benefits just keep coming to him. And then it also, it, it induces holiness in us. I know as Lutherans, we don't really like talking about that sometimes. It's like we increase in holiness. That sounds strange because we don't use that language necessarily. But as we grow in sanctification in our lives, as the new man starts to take precedence over the old sinful nature, they're always both there, this side of death. But... We're going to get ahead of them a little bit, hopefully, in our lives. And as we do that, we get a greater appreciation for how the word is transformative. It's transformative in our lives. So when we're tempted to take the wrong path, meditating, thinking about scripture, brings you back to the correct path because scripture is the correct path. And it's also a warning, and we'll, we'll come to that uh, toward the end of this section, to be alert, because you can miss stuff that quickly, that easily. So we start by loving the word, meditating on it throughout the day. And I think sometimes that's what the monks, in all their monkery, that, as Luther would say that they did, that one of the things that they really gained from doing that is they really knew their scripture, particularly the Psalms. You know, you get up seven times a day to sing Psalms. You're going to know them all by heart pretty quickly. You know, if you do all of them seven times a day and they did five or six Psalms every time, that's all the Psalms in like three or four days. And then you do them again. Uh, on top of everything else they were probably singing. So that's a lot of Psalms. They probably got that even though it was in a different language that maybe makes you think more. Because they knew what it said. They were all fluent in Latin. So they're singing it in Latin. They're thinking about it. Uh, and there's proof that <clears throat> things that you sing, you remember better. Mm -hmm. It hardwires better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those guys were hardwired to the Psalms, if you think about it. It's like they probably just knew, oh, there's a song for that. But they could spit it right out. Although, on the other hand, Luther would always say, well, you know, as it says in Matthew chapter 6, and it's like chapter 12, because he constantly got that stuff wrong, but that's okay. Uh, huh? At least he was in the right book. Yeah, at least he was in the right book most of the time. I used to do that with Pastor Davis all the time. We're like, oh, you know, that's in Scripture somewhere. And he's like, it's in Philippians. And no, I think it's in, uh, you know, like Thessalonians. It's like, no, it's in Corinthians. We're both wrong, and it took us 20 minutes to find it. <laughs> Kept this book. Keeps us both humble, yeah. So, okay, so we've established that the psalmist loves scripture. He says it makes it wiser than his enemies because it's always with them. And he has more understanding than his teachers because he's made God's law his, his lessons. So, 
Hmm. I can understand. I think we can understand being wiser than our enemies. We like to think we're smarter than our enemies, don't we? But uh, I'm not. You see, his commands that are. Yeah. There you go. Oh, but more understanding than all my teachers. I know a couple of seminary professors that would have a few words to say about that. So, how are we to have more understanding than those that teach us? So, what teachers are they? Is the psalmist actually talking about? I'm sure it's not his religion teacher. The Holy Spirit. Hmm? The Holy Spirit. Is it the Holy Spirit? Or is it? Oh, that's who's teaching him. But when he's saying that he has more wisdom than his teachers, are those the teachers of the world? Or are those the teachers of the law? Would those be the fellas he's listening to in synagogue or the fellas he's listening to on the street corner? Could be both. Could be both. Yeah. Could be both. So if it's, if it's protecting us from our enemies because we're wiser than them, and it's making us wiser than our teachers, then these teachers must be the ones that are teaching us the way of the world. Because if they're teaching us God's way, we wouldn't have talked about them that way. It's like, ah, you know, your teachers, those who teach your law make me wise. He would have said something like that. In fact, he does say something like that in other places. So... Like, woe on you, Pharisees. Yeah, kind of like a lot like that. Over there. Right. Yeah, because Jesus called those guys out. They knew the law backward and forward, right? They could have quoted chapter and verse, tell you everything you were doing wrong, and yet they missed the whole point. So they missed everything about salvation, right? We have to practice it. You do have to do that. Well, they even thought they were doing that. I mean, they, they had they they had scales over their eyes so thick because they built this false law around the commandments. Because, hey, if we don't do this stuff, we're not even going to get near doing that stuff. And they just completely blew it. That's what I'm referring to. Yeah. They got called out on that, too. Right. You change the laws so that you benefit. Right, right. I mean, it's kind of nice when you can write the law the way you want to, right? Then it's easier for you to follow it. At least where the law of the Lord comes from. So. And that probably started way back in Judges? Probably, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the nonsense uh, as far as the, the additional rules and whatnot they were making up, probably. I know it really got heavy in the time between the Testaments that we don't see, except in the Apocrypha, but that's where really, where the Pharisee party really took the lead and really took kind of control of the religious life because they were battling out with the other groups, so to speak, before then. And then all of a sudden, you're like, the New Testament opens, is like, these guys are in charge and oh, look, all the Romans are here. They appeared from someplace. But yeah, you see that in the, the Apocrypha, like the... Uh, the stories of the Maccabean kings, you really kind of see how the Pharisees came to the front and then you'll see like where the Romans came from and what happened to the Greeks. So there, there's good stuff to read in there. Um, yeah, let's throw one more verse while we're at it. Okay, and then I understand more than the aged for I keep your precepts. So we have these Enemies that aren't too bright. We have teachers that he's smarter than, and then he's also wiser than the wise. You know, the people that have life experience, all this, and he's wiser than them because he's doing something different from what they are. So you can live to be, you know, 102, and if you follow the way of the world, that's not going to help you one bit when it comes to the kingdom of God, right? Right? If you have no clue who Christ is, that and all that wisdom and all that knowledge and all that life experience work will get you exactly nothing. Uh, same thing with being leaders in the world as opposed to not leaders in the church. That sounds terrible. Uh, so being a leader in you know secular pursuits rather than leaders in pursuing God's knowledge, the knowledge God has for us, right? If we don't understand God's law, Again, following the ways of the world might make you a multi-billionaire like, you know, like Bill Gates or uh, that other guy I don't like from South Africa. What's his name? John Space Diesel? No, the SpaceX guy. Oh, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Couldn't think of his name. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you want to feel depressed, read Elon Musk's like uh, Wikipedia page. <laughs> it's like, like, 
oh, and he's always oh, old, like a month younger than I am. Oh, wow. So, but, you know, he's got all the money in the world. He's got all the cool companies and he's developing all the cool technology. But if he doesn't know who God is, you know, if he doesn't know who his creator is and where he's going, none of that is going to, and I don't know what, what he's like faith-wise. I have no clue. But if he doesn't know who Christ is, all that is going to net him exactly nothing when this all comes to an end. So just having that, that knowledge of God's law and our imperfect knowledge of God's law, and I don't think the psalmist really emphasizes that enough. Um, he almost kind of goes the other way. You know, well, it says, I hold my feet back from every evil way in order to keep your word. I know we try to do that, but we don't succeed, right? Uh, so he's kind of painting a perfect picture of what the perfect follower of God's law would be. But we know we don't do that. Um, so even his imperfect means of following it is, is better than just following the way of the world. I really should write notes in a smaller font so I can't read them at all. Uh, Saves time. Yeah, it does. And here's a little thought exercise that I stole from somebody else. Uh, we kind of touched on this. So how many, how many believers, if we asked them, would deny loving the Bible? None of them, right? Because that's... Uh, that's what it's all about. Yet everybody that says that they love God's word needs to answer a question. Is that claim really true? Like, hmm, of course it's true. I love God's word. So, I mean, yeah, I mean that, don't I? But how many of us, you know, don't read our Bible every day? How many of us don't pray as we ought? Um, how often do we just don't feel like going to church today because I don't really want to hear what the preacher has to say, or I don't want to sing, or I just don't want to be with all the others today. It's just, you know, not, not today. And I don't want to stand up for it. I don't want to defend it in front of other people. It's my private religion, right? It's none of anybody's business. How often do we do that in our lives? And I'm not saying all the time, but... Sometimes when the chips are on the line and we're called to defend the faith, do we? Like we should? No. But we say we do. There would be nobody here at this table, and I'm not picking on anybody, just saying there's nobody here at this table that would say, no, I don't love God's word. Of course I defend it. You know, and I'll defend to the death our ability to worship freely and blah, blah, blah. Do we really? I mean, is that really just... That is that what we're meditating on all the time. That's a pretty high calling. You know, I can only think of one individual that ever did that perfectly, right? It would be Christ. You know, he's the only one that was able to do that. We can. I think I would say we all desire to. Sure we do. Sure we do. We had a, a family, a very good friend, uh, and she happened to be a minister as well. Uh, wife and also daughter. She was the kind who was never afraid to speak for Christ. Mm -hmm. And every time she went any place, by car, train, who knows, she didn't know people. Greyhound. Uh -huh. yeah, Greyhound. She mm -hmm. always, always talked to them about Christ. <laughs> I'm always very impressed by people that do that because I'm Try. I mean, I'm an introvert. It's, it's that's why I wear the collar every place because that makes people talk to me, and so it's like, well, and I can't just be rude and not talk to them. But they're like, oh, father, you know, it's, of course, father, right? It's like, oh, father, blah blah blah, and then you wind up. I wind up getting pulled in the conversations I wouldn't have just because I got it on. Because otherwise, I wouldn't do that. Um, but then you got people like you're talking about, or like Pastor Davis, he can't go into a grocery store and not talk to 10 people. And it's just like, how are you, how do you do that? I, I can't do that. I can't do that to one. Maybe I could, you can learn to do it, but, but yeah, it's, it's just amazing to see people doing that in, in the real world and go, wow. That is a prime example of a gift. 
Yeah, yeah, that is a gift for sure, for sure. She might not have converted anybody, but I'm sure she made a lot of people sing. Yeah, and I mean, that's, yeah, but God even tells us that. He goes, okay, you know, some, some sow, others reap. Uh, the Holy Spirit works when and where he wills. We don't know when he goes in somebody's ear and converts somebody. You just know, okay, I threw the seed. That's like, that's what that parable of the sower is all about. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, everybody wants to make it the parable of the four kinds of soil. What kind of soil are you? No, that is about the guy throwing the seeds, which is God. And he doesn't care that it doesn't all go into the fertile, ready to sprout ground. It goes, some of it goes on rocks. Some of it goes in sun scorched, you know, path where everybody walks and the birds eat some. He doesn't care. It's getting thrown out there anyway. You know, that's the point is it's going to go and it's not going to, the word's not going to come back to him empty. Uh, so it doesn't matter how you do it or what you talk to. Personalities help too in this whole thing because sure. there's some people who have the knack and of, of saying things in a nice way or in a, in a certain way that people enjoy listening to them. And then you have others that are just plain obnoxious, you know. <laughs> This yeah, is true. I really wouldn't want them to <laughs> spread the... <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So let's see. Here's a good here's a good passage from First Peter. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as a flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by the gospel by which the gospel is preached to you. You know, in that uh, the word of the Lord endures forever, that's that's the motto of the Reformation. That was what the, the early Lutherans, or not the earliest Lutherans, but on a few years after Luther's death, <laughs> When uh, they started, you'll see this on some of our artwork. You'll see a cross and you'll see these letters V, D, M, A. Verbum Domini may not in eternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. That was their motto. And they sewed it on the sleeves of their clothes uh, and on the hilt of their swords. And uh, I know one Lutheran pastor that's got it on the, engraved on the grips of his gun. But he's a strange guy. But, uh, but that was, that's what they did. They, they engraved that everywhere because that was their battle cry. That was when, you know, the church really wanted to, the Roman church really wanted to wipe these guys out. And it came to war, you know, began to come to war. Uh, to be free to, to preach Christ crucified without all the baggage that the church wanted to attach to it. Um, and you look at those guys and you look how those guys loved the word, Right. And go, wow, would I do that? I don't know. (laughs) I'm getting right out there. It's like, okay. It's like, your God or your life, choose. And it's like, okay, here's my neck. Yikes. I don't know. But if they hadn't done that at that time, of course, God says that his word is going to endure forever. There will always be people like that. Uh, Let's see. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, Peter again. Peter Peter has some great, we don't have much of his writing, but he has some great stuff considering all the stupid things he did, (laughs) right? He'd have these magnificent moments and these incredible falls. It's like, that's like the opening credits of Live World of Sports back in the day, right? The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. You always see that one guy on the ski slope that just goes... It's like, that's got to hurt. You know, for 30 seconds, you're watching him fall down this mountain. The well, agony of defeat. Along with my feet, do my head and my ears and my yeah. chin. Yeah, or, uh, or this Sunday's gospel we're preaching on is, uh, you know, it's like, Lord, no, I'm never going to let that happen to you. And Jesus is like, what? <laughs> no, get behind me, Satan. Yeah, yeah so that's Sunday's. So I guess some, I guess the point I'm making, if I'm making a point tonight, I don't know. If I'm making a point, it's that this, our love for the word and our devotion for it, you know, isn't just lip service. We all, we all truly love God's word. We wouldn't be here sitting around the table, 
But then we could still probe and go, okay, but what about the times when? And, and to know that, no, we're not perfect yet in that respect. Probably never going to be. Uh, but it's just a, it's a checks and balances, I guess we could call it. That, yeah, you know, we, could, we do all this and we can still do more. We can still do better. Uh, and it doesn't consume your life. I know some people will make the arguments like, well, you know, I go to church and I go to Bible study and I'm on this committee and I do that. And so it's not like I'm always at church. No, you're really not. If you, if you look how many hours you're spending, it's really not. Uh, but it's still a lot more than other people do. Uh, but we're not, that's not the point. That's not what we're comparing. It's just a, some people say that, or I had one fellow say, well, he's got to take a break because he's doing too much. And it's like, okay, then take a break. Nobody's going to yell at you for that. You know, you have things to do, but, you know, still be in church on Sunday. Oh, no, 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 I'll be in church on Sunday, you know. Uh, I just think sometimes we we either set goals or we set bars and for ourselves. And then when we don't live up to those standards we make for ourselves, we get de- depressed, a little despondent. And then we wonder, you know, do I really, do I really have faith? Do I really love God? And then you realize what God actually expects of us. That's so much higher than that bar we set. And you just go, oh yeah. Okay. So that was dumb in the first place. You could be asking this question. And I should be saying is, you know, forgive me. I'd like to do better. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm just kind of babbling now, I think, on this first part. I know Jesus Paul said pray continuously. Hmm? Paul said pray continuously. He does. He does say that. He also preached so late that somebody fell out the window and died, but it's mm-hmm. my favorite story. He did bring him back to life in his defense. So. <laughs> and speaking of rest, even Jesus went off to rest. And oh, yeah. Yeah. The time in the boat, he was back in the boat sleeping. Yeah, I mean, it's like, Jesus, what, don't you care that we're perishing? He's like, what, really? It's like, you're, I'm in the boat with you guys. Did you, you really are not getting this. I don't know. What, I, there's, a certain, the thing. there's certain points in the Gospels that I would just have loved to have been standing there as one of them to wonder what I would do. It's like, should we and it's like, should we, don't wake him up, he's tired. Like, what? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you never noticed what he did. He went off alone to pray, first of all. It's like, okay, you guys stay here. I'm going over there to pray all night long. But that was refreshing. Like, wow, I don't know. What did him and God talk about all night? It's just one of those questions I like to throw out there. Like, what did they have to say? Probably a lot. But what did they? Yeah, yeah. Kind of interesting. I would imagine, and there's nowhere in the Bible that it says anything, but he probably talked to his father about the stiff-necked people. Oh, probably. No doubt. No doubt. That they hadn't changed. From it's like, in the beginning, when they haven't changed since Eden. Yeah, these stiff-necked people. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. I mean, it makes you. I mean, I just kind of like these little thought experiment things. But what if Jesus hadn't come during the first century? What if he came today? <laughs> Which okay, what kind of adventures would he have had with the guys going? Where would it have been in the Middle East? Where would he have gone? The United States, really? Like where? Oh, you've seen the movie? Hmm? You've seen the movie? What movie? Perfect Stranger. No, I have not seen that. Is that kind of the same yeah. thing? <laughs> Is it good? Yeah, I might have to check that out. That, that sounds entertaining. Like There's just, yeah. I mean, people in his own hometown wanted to throw him off a cliff. Yeah. So, ugh. Can't be a prophet in your own home. No, you cannot. <laughs> no, you cannot. Does anything good come out of yeah, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I, I love the, the John uh, movie where they just narrate the entire Gospel of John. When, what was that? Was that Philip that said that? 
Which one says that? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Or is it Nathaniel? Nathaniel. It was Nathaniel. And the way he says, can any, he just has that exactly how you would think something. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, really? Ugh, Nazareth. Okay, so this first section just gave us a pretty good idea of what we're supposed to do when we're tempted to take this wrong path. The psalmist makes it sound like he never took the path in the first place because he's, he's got his eyes on God's law. It's his meditation all day. It prevents him from taking the wrong path. He's trying to be faithful to it. Let's say he's trying to be faithful to it. He's making it the guide for his life and he's alert and he's watching his footing. He's watching where he goes. But then we go into the next section when following the word can set you down a path you didn't expect that's not an easy path. Um, or as Christ said, the narrow path. I was just talking with somebody today about that. It's like, you know, the, the path is narrow. It's really easy to take the broad path because it's the path of least resistance. Uh, when, it's, when it's uphill and this wide and you're going to fall off the edge at any moment, it's a little tougher some days. What does Alter say for verse 106? Oh, verse 106, he says, I swore and I will fulfill it to observe your just laws. So right before that, a lamp to my feet is your word and a light to my path. I swore and I will fulfill it to observe your laws. So he made a promise to God. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, I... I have a hard time reading these two sections personally without picturing these are Christ's words because all the Psalms are about him. And he's the only one that could actually make those statements and make them true. We could try, uh, but nine times out of 10, when we try to do something, we turn it into our works anyway. And somehow I'm justifying myself. Uh, but when you think of it as Christ, what Christ has already done, it's, a lot easier to read, I think. It, it makes it easier to read. But then isn't it like the Lord's Prayer in a way that we are expected when we read this to hide his word in our heart, to make his word the lamp unto our feet mm -hmm. and, and walk that way. This is another model of how to sure. do that. Absolutely. You know, and, and again, it's a model or a, or a template, I guess we'd say nowadays, you know, because we're looking at things on our computers. It's a template for how to make it through life. Uh, that worked for him because he's perfect. We can be a bad copy. Sometimes it works for us. Sometimes it doesn't. Some days it's smeared all together. And other days it's crystal clear. And you, you wonder why you ever faltered. Uh, I like oh yeah, that'd be a good, it's a good illustration like a something that's been Xeroxed a billion times um, yeah but if we think of this as Christ's words then then uh, it it makes perfect sense and it's perfectly understandable how it can be done because he could do it um now, even though I probably because this is the gospel for was it the gospel? No, it was the it was the gospel, the New Testament reading from daily prayer today. It was when Jesus sends out the the twelve before he sends the seventy two. Mm -hmm. He sends out the twelve and he goes, "Okay, don't take any money, don't take an extra shirt, don't take extra sand, don't take nothing. Just go find people that want to listen to you, stay with them. They'll feed you because you're worth being fed for bringing them the word, and then move on to the next town." But if they don't want to hear what you have to say, then you shake the dust off your shoes and go to the next town. Because guess what? These people are going to try to take you to the synagogues and stone you and beat you. And we didn't hear any of those stories. Did, some, did that happen to some of them sometimes? Maybe. They didn't record it in the Gospels for us, but Jesus warned them, this is what's going to happen to you. And then they come back so happy. It's like, wow, all this stuff happened. We even cast out demons in your name. I mean, the everything was awesome and then last sunday's gospel is right after that and it's like they already forgot all that stuff happened it's like one day was hard and there's like oh 
It's like, do you not remember anything that happened to you before today? But that's the way we are, aren't we? As soon as that stumbling block, that first thing gets in our path, we want to forget all the good that God's done for us. Some of us want to forget all the good God's done for us just when you have one bumpy day. I mean, it's like, like our daughter. Okay, when she's doing homework, okay? So I, I really try not to put dad stories in, but, you know. So, I mean, she's a smart kid, and she does well in school, and then she has one day where all of a sudden she has to work at it because it doesn't come easy. And she's like, oh, this is so hard. Oh, you know. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but she's 14. No, it's like, oh, this is so hard. I'm never going to get this, like, and then, you know, she aces it because she spends five minutes figuring it out. <laughs> Are we any different when it comes to God's so life? Like, oh, you know, God, this is hard. I don't want to do this today. You know, Blech. And then we make it through because we actually think of the things God's told us to do to get through it, like going to him and going, God, this is hard. And we survive. And then who, what are we? We're Thanks, God. I appreciate that. Right. But I did it. I feel good because look what I did. Because I just forgot how I did it. Because five minutes ago, it was. So what I'm saying is that our our walk with Christ is like being a 14 year old girl forever. Maybe that's my point. (laughs) Being being, being my our 14 year old girl forever. Hmm? Use the word person. Hmm? Use the word person. Person, yes. Yeah, so one 14-year-old person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Well. What does Alter say about verse 109? Verse 109, he says, verse 109 says, my life is at risk at all times, yet your teaching I do not forget. Yeah, I hope I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. You know, like in this translation, the ESV, it's like, okay, you hold your life. You're the one holding your life in your hand. And then Alter's translation is, it's out of his hands. His life is continually in danger from outside forces is the way I read that. And I don't know what's correct because those are kind of very different takes. Yeah, another way you could take it is though I constantly take my life in my hands, it's okay, I'm making choices. Mm -hmm. What's this going to do to me? That's a good point. I didn't think of it that way. That's a real good point. Yeah, so my life is at risk at all times that you're teaching, I don't forget. So I have two ways I can go. The way of life, though, because we just read the beginning of the Didache in in daily prayer. So the way that apostles start that document is there are two ways of life, the way of life and the way of death. And then they talk about the faith that way with that duality. So his life's at risk at all times because he could make the wrong choice. But your teaching, I don't forget, which keeps him again on that going the right way. I like that. I th- is that where you were going with it? Because that, that makes, yeah, that, that sounds really, that's a really a good way to look at it. how you apply the law. To yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. And the deceiver helps you do it incorrectly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because it looks like the right way to go. Yeah, because that's his trap. That's the wicked set of trap for me. That's the trap he pulls for us all the time because it makes it look like. Well, this would be a good thing to do. Yeah. And then when the results show up, hey, I guess that wasn't so smart. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. You know, just like when... You know, just like when the devil is, is tempting Christ in the wilderness, it's like, oh, all you got to do is bow down and worship me. And I'll make all this yours. It's like, already mine. But it's already <laughs> his, stupid. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, what, do you really think that was going to work? Well, the devil didn't know what to make of this. It's like, okay, here's God. And all of a sudden he's a person now. Like all these other people. I wonder if they're going to be as easy as all the other ones are. It's like, no, this one's different. That, yeah. That had to be interesting. Very interesting. And then he might stand back and take a look and say, I really don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> We're yeah. going to rearrange it later. Yeah, very much. Well, my translation may be weird throughout a lot of this. Which one are you reading today? Oh, it's the 
children's condensed. But but it's it's a children's gra- illustrated contemporary English version. Where did you grab that off of? Oh, over there. Oh, there okay. Of it's like, okay. Um, yeah, but I have the ESV. But I like what it says better yeah. here. What does it say? Save me, Lord, as you said you would for 107. Uh-huh. You know, I am zero, severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Mm-hmm. Well, I like it as you said you would. Yeah. But yeah, Which is what that says. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I know. I just, I, I like the plain. I like the way that says it too. Sometimes I think going back to some of those children's Bibles is not a bad thing some days. <clears throat> Get a little squishy, as you say, on the... Yeah, but, you know, but it gets you to the point sometimes. And I think we try to use language to, you know, obscure the point. By trying to clarify it, we make it harder than it has to be sometimes. You look like you want to say something. At the end. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Is it hard? Why was it so hard? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, you can't see the effects of a person's face or a mask. It's the eyes. Everything is moving. <laughs> the eyes. I have a reference for 109 to Job 13, 14. Okay. And Job is saying, why should I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Take my flesh and my teeth. What does that mean? I know. That sounds like it should mean something. Oh, boy. Have I... Job what? Job 13, 14, and then on to 15. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. Hmm. Anyway, that was my reference from verse 109. 109, yeah. What chapter, Job, was that? 13, 14. 13, 14, okay. I happen, I see this Alter's Bible is a hardcover and I'm slowly scanning it all so I can have it in here. And I happen to have Job, let's see, Job 13. Because he has good historical information too. 13, 14, you said? Yep. Okay, hang on just a second. Thirteen fourteen says, Why should I bear my flesh in my teeth and my life breath place in my palm? Okay, that's even harder. My life breath place in my palm. Elsewhere, this is an idiom for putting oneself in great danger. But the parallelism with the first verse would seem to highlight the physical concreteness of the image. That did not help me understand that at all. <laughs> the footnote in mine for thirteen fourteen says, he is fearful that he might not survive such an audience. You go back a couple chapters. That's true. Okay. It says, Job, in chapter 10, he says, I would plead with God. 11 says, Zophar urges Job to repent. And then 12 through 13, Job's answering his critics. So here, yeah, and then it'll he, be... might be, he might, he's afraid he might not survive an audience. That's right, because in a couple more chapters, then God has something to say back to him, which yeah. is one of the best passages in the Bible, in my opinion. But, yeah. I would say we should do a Bible study on Job, but we would never get oh, done. That's a tough one. That's a hard one. Because yeah. the whole time we'd be going, man, I'm glad this stuff didn't happen to me. <laughs> Easier to do revelation. I, I, I don't know. That was the first one I did when I came here, so it's almost it's going to be too soon to do it again. But yeah, I love Revelation, especially the first couple chapters. Oh yeah. What's well, your, where's your personality fit in here with these churches? <laughs> right. What's interesting is which of those churches is the places are still around, and which ones are not. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so so this this second passage that we looked at, uh, it kind of just reinforces what we read in the the first section we looked at today, which is, you know, that lamp unto our feet and a light to our path, God's word, it's there, you can take it with you. You know, you don't have to take it with you in a book, you take it with you in your head and in your heart. You know, we know now, how long have we been going to church? We know 
what it tells us to do, where to turn when things get tough. And yet we still don't do it all the time. We don't follow that own good advice that we have written on our hearts. We know which path to take. We know what to do when the way gets hard. But then God will also continue to reveal his law to us. He will renew our ability. That's what that verse 106 really is about, I think. You know, I've sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. We can't do that. But God can t- has taken an oath with us that he will write his law on our hearts and that he will continue to bring it to us. Every time, every time we get lost, he will continually put that in our path. He puts the gospel in our path. Um, it's our decision whether or not we reject it. But he always puts it, always puts it there. And it renews our strength to take this oath that the psalmist takes. And I guess the point we haven't really touched on is when, when we rely on God's light to light the way. And, and we're, we're good at understanding that. But then sometimes the way that God's light lights and you take a look at that path and just go, this is going to, sorry, I got to say it the way we would say it today, but it's like, God, this is going to suck. I can see what's ahead. This is not going to be good. You know, this is, I don't want to do it. You know, and, and then we have to look at things like what when Christ was in the garden, he looked at what's going to happen tomorrow and go, yeah, this is not going to be good. I don't want to do this. And God said, yeah, you do. You've got to do this. And then he sent angels to strengthen him. But like even Jesus said, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do what you say is right. What is the right thing to do? And he will obey. And he did that for us. So when we look at the path and go, yeah, this is not going to be good. This is not going to be easy. I'm not going to like this one bit. But if he could carry Christ through bearing the sin of the world for our benefit, I think he can carry us through whatever we see in the path. That's going to be not a whole lot of fun. And sometimes we have years of our lives or even decades people have that are not good or not easy or are not fun. And those are the most remarkable people of faith to talk to because they, you look at them and go, how are you bearing all this? And they're like, because God's got my back. And you're like, oh, of course he does. You're like, duh. You, know, you can see how the strength this person has. And it's like, why do I doubt? Why do I doubt when it's something way more minor than whatever that person is suffering or Job or Christ even? You know, we just, we see it. We see examples of it in our lives. God puts these people in our path to see that's how you suffer. That's how you follow Christ and that's how you suffer. And that's how you do it. And we go, okay, that's amazing. But then when it's my turn, it's like, I don't know if I can do this. That's that's the thing we have to work on, some of us. You can't do it. No, I can't do it, right? Because if it's all about me, we're in really big trouble. Really big trouble. It's impossible for us to put all our worries and everything in God's hands. As a human being, I think it's impossible. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. I mean, we we can think of, of, of faith and righteousness and God's love, and we think of it in these... Uh, yeah, I can't even find the right word for it, but it's a, a, it's like a bag of tricks or, or magic tricks. Is that you've got these things you can pull out for any situation. You have a, a answer for, I guess party tricks not a bad thing. It's like you have it's like you have an answer for every little situation that you could go boop and boop and boop. You know, it's like when uh, what was it? Uh, Lu- was it Lucy had you know psychology five cents? Oh yeah, the doctors it? in five right. The doctors cents. in five cents. You know, it's like for five cents she has all the answers, and you can give those answers to people. Here's my five cents worth, uh, but then when it's us. We can't take our own advice because then all of a sudden our problems are so much darker and deeper than anything else you've ever seen before. We don't take the advice that God has given us to take, even though we're able to give that advice to other people. That makes sense. It's it's easy to give it out, but it's not as easy to take it yourself. Maybe. I don't know. Or you think, 
or someone asks you for assistance with something or asks you, well, how do I, how do I deal with this? And you go, well, how can I answer this person? I mean, I don't even know how to handle this myself. What am I going to tell them that's going to be profound? You know, sometimes we have the ready answer. Sometimes we don't, even though we do, but it's our human brokenness that doesn't let it come out. And I think, you know, uh, Doris, that's exactly what you're saying. It's impossible for a human being to actually throw all this stuff at God's feet because we're human. If we don't want to just let go, we can't. Uh, we've always got to have our fingers in the pie somehow. If we're not on it, we're, out of con- we're, we're, we're not in control. And that's what we're afraid of is not having control. But you're not in control until you let go of all the control and let him have control. You know, I saw I saw some of this um, with the handicapped or the mentally ill. They can do a better job of that than we can because sometimes they just they they don't they're not capable of thinking about some of this. They're overthinking. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, because you'll you'll see someone like that that has like just going okay. That's what they mean by childlike faith because they're not overthinking it. It's not childish faith. But it's not overwrought because, again, you know, we have our big brains and we have to overthink everything because, you know, I got to help God out to understand what my problem is because he's not going to get it. Okay. Yeah, I missed out there, I think, for tonight. Actually, on that last one, I think he gets it, but there's a lot of things that he leaves to us to resolve on our own. Oh, yeah. I mean, he can figure out I mean, a how good, we got into that mess in the first place. Sure, because a good parent is going to let you go up to the stove after you've told him three times it's hot, don't touch it. And he's going to let you walk by. I know he's going up there to touch it, and you're going to let him because if he doesn't do it, he's never going to understand what it means. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> well, Carl caught on fire. Huh? Carl actually caught on fire by the stove. Well, I, mean, I, was, I was just telling somebody the story. It's like, you know, you, you tell your kid, don't touch the stove because it's hot. Don't touch it because it's hot. And she burns herself. And you're like, see, I told you. And then the, like an hour later, I went up to the stove and grabbed a pot where I knew the handle had been over the flame <laughs> and was still hot and grabbed right hold of it and just like, I'm not letting anybody see how bad this hurts because oh, that was dumb. And it was a cast iron skillet. Yeah, like, really? You can't drop those. One of the things that helped help save Carl from a lot of burns yeah, we, we have a, um, a sofa or couch, well, it's a, it's a seat <laughs> in, in the kitchen, and it wraps around and then ends up at the stove. Well, he liked to watch me cook. So he would lean over that a lot. And um, what happened was that he had a, a 100% cotton shirt on. Because it was very less... Uh, it was slower, and um, it didn't do what these other materials do. Yeah, like the synthetics, they just uh, melt. Oh, oh yeah. How do they go slow? Yeah. Marilu, you had a question. It was not about the Psalms. That's all right. But in uh, this past, I think it was this past Sunday sermon, Uh-oh. you alluded to the mustard seed. Yes. Okay, now, what I need to know is, or would like to know, we know of the mustard being a plant that's just like Mm -hmm. this and yellow and so on, and and, uh, farmers grow it to make the mustard. But in the, in Matthew, it says that it, the seed is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows, it is one of the largest garden plants it becomes big enough for the wild birds to come and build their nest in its branches. Mm-hmm. So, so obviously in Bible days they had like a mustard tree. Do you know? Yes, and you can actually look at some of them. You look at the uh, like the mustard plant had the like the yellow flowers, right? And right. it just kind of just looks like an ordinary plant. And then you have the the tree, uh, which I'm trying to find a really a picture, not an artist drawing of it. Now, what's, but, what is it? Is yeah, it's just called a mustard tree. Yeah. Is its purpose just to be a tree, for, or is it used for 
some kind of food item or? I don't know. I, I, I looked all that stuff up once and I forgot what I learned, which is not good. Yeah, so Salvadora persica is what our mustard plant is. And then the plant. Yeah, the ones out by the Jordan River, they get over like 10 feet tall. I mean, so calling it a huge tree is a little stretchy, but it does get to be a pretty big plant. Uh, so that, yeah, like birds will nest in it and so forth. So what was interesting about it is, even though it's the smallest seed that has been produced. Yeah, so the, the, this kind of, so it's more like a scrub tree. So it's kind of, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a big, huge tree, but it's decent oh, size. I guess so. Yeah. Like a pin -out. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, that's like ragweeds. They get, uh, you know, the Anyone else like to see it? <laughs> <laughs> Problems this time of year. Thank you for looking at it. Sure. That's like the, uh, uh, where's the other one? My brain broke. I forgot. I was going to say something profound about another Bible plant, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> oh, but there's a lot of different plants, like ordinary ragweed gets two, three foot high this time of year, and it drives people nuts. But they got giant ragweed, too. And it's, <laughs> yeah, they can <laughs> keep that stuff. I mean, really big. You know, it, it, there was a, there's a plant that up around town and around here that looks like a, it's got a bushy head on it. And it's only showed up around here in, in the last, oh, probably 30 years. And uh, we don't know exactly where it came from. <laughs> and it gets to be seven, eight foot tall, 10 foot tall, and a seat on it about that long. And when it started appearing, they blamed um, a friend of mine that was farming for Simmons at the time for, because he was uh, experimenting with different kinds of grasses and hay. You know, they said, that oh, that came from something he did. Well, I don't think so, but it's it's here. It's definitely here. Well, it's like down yeah. south on the, on the sides of like the interstate and stuff, the kudzu has taken over everything. Well, somebody brought it in and are like, oh, look at the way this vine just covers the landscape. It looks real nice. Yeah. And then it's like the entire, like all of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia is just on the side of the interstates. It's just covered with this. It covers the trees. It just grows and covers everything in its path. What is it? Kudzu. Yeah. And you, you can't kill it. I mean, they, they poison it, they burn it, and it just keeps coming back. That was brought in as a ground cover. Yeah. And it did. Oh, it did. All right. That's right. It covers everything it touches. I mean, it looks neat till you realize it's killing everything underneath it. Now, I'm not 100% certain, but I think it was an Asian plant. Probably. Probably. It's like that one little fish that's trying to make its way into Lake Michigan, or yeah, it was invasive carp? species. No, yeah, it's some. I think it's some kind of old carp or something, but it's going to like kill everything if it gets loose. Oh well. Well, we should probably stop there and join together in the Lord's Prayer tonight. Mm -hmm. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.